What's the matter, Mr. Bagley? Is my coffee good this morning? No, it's fine, Kitty. Matter of fact, it's too good for the customers here. And you're too pretty to be boring it for them. And what else would I be doing? Seems to me a girl like you could do almost anything she wanted to do. If she chose the right man. The right man? Here in Grants Pass? It's possible you haven't been looking in the right direction. I'd say that's uh, quite possible. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm Ward Cameron. I rode in rather late last night. Joe Begley's my name. Mr. Begley? Miss Kitty. Miss Kitty? My, that coffee smells good. How about some ham and eggs to go with it? Yes, sir. Well, Mr. Begley, can you tell me what time the mining company office opens? Any minute now. Oh, you excuse me, Mr. Cameron, there's my boss. I must be on my way. dangerous or deadly than the knife. It was a silent and frightening instrument. Well, hello, Dell. I'll do anything to make a point. This was the most popular cutlery of the day. It was a famous bowie knife used by Jim Bowie of Alamo fame. It was made for him by a blacksmith named James Black in Hempstead County, Arkansas, in 1830. The price ranged from $5 to $50, depending on how fancy you wanted it. Yes, sir, with a sticker like this, old Jim Boy was a real cut-up. Thirty-seven times, I haven't got it yet. Another favorite of the day was uh, this Arkansas toothpick. It usually had a very smooth, sleek handle, and a needle-sharp point and two sharp edges. My old great-grandfather had one of these. Double-edged Powell, they called it. He was as sharp as a matzo ball. For those who wanted to get him coming and going, this uh, Toro knife was available. It was patterned after the horns of the famous bulls of Mexico. The most important thing you had to learn about a knife is when to use it and when not to, as we shall see in our story this week entitled Checkmate. You're asking me to believe you didn't even see that man. I told you before, Sheriff, there wasn't time. He stuck a gun in my back and blindfolded me. And then he forced you to give him the combination of that safe. Yes! Look, someone unfolded that door. It couldn't be unbolted from the outside. It had to be you, Scott. You must be Sheriff Roark. That's right. Who might you be? Ward J. Cameron, Cameron National Detective Agency, Denver, Colorado. Are you a detective? I just happened to be in town about some of the Grant Mining Company's bullion shipments. And since it's their payroll and their partners in this bank, Mr. Stewart asked me to investigate. So they want you to take over? Oh, well, let's say help out. I've met Mr. Begley here, but I don't believe I know your name, sir. That's John Scott. He's the cashier who was here at the time of the robbery. I understand you found him bound and blindfolded. That's right. Scott says the man was inside when he got here and blindfolded him before Scott had a chance to see him, before Scott to give him the combination to that safe. That's his story. Uh, may I see your wrist, Mr. Scott? Hmm? They're badly chafed. Looks like a robber wasn't taking any chances. And now may I see the blindfold, Sheriff? Well, you can't see a thing. What does that prove? Well, it could be he didn't want to be recognized, and that would probably mean that somebody Mr. Scott knew. Of course Scott knew, and the blindfold was a trick. I told you the truth. You know, by now, I thought you should be able to tell us how the man got inside the bank in the first place. That door it was bolted last night. I know, I checked it myself. Could it have been unbolted from the outside? Of course not. What if it could? If that window were left open just enough to allow a wire to pass through with a hook on the end of it. Look, Sheriff, this bolt has been oiled recently. It slides easily. 
Which one of us are you accusing, Mr. Cameron? No one. I'm just saying the robber had to have access to the bank. Well, both Scott and I have keys. Perhaps you'd better arrest us both, Sheriff. Your deputy said Mr. Sanderson's been shot. He's dead. You sent for Dr. Porter. He couldn't come. I can sign a death certificate just as well. You're a doctor? She is. Dr. Sarah Martin. Mr. Cameron. Mr. Cameron, you'll want to know the approximate time of death on the certificate. I already know it. Just do what you have to do. I uh, think we can let Mr. Scott and Mr. Begley go now. We know where they were at the time of the robbery. Mr. Scott was here, and Mr. Begley was lingering over his breakfast. And I must say, he had a very pretty reason to linger. Thank you, Mr. Cameron. Just be sure you don't leave town, Scott. I'm staying at the hotel if you have any questions. May I walk you back, Doctor? Of course. I'll make out that certificate for you, Sheriff. Good day, Mr. Cameron. Good day. I think we'd better check the mines for absentee, Sheriff. Everyone in town's a suspect. Well, I still figure someone from out of town, and Scott knows who. Yes, but no one saw the man get away. So he's probably hiding out, waiting for a chance to make a move. He's not going to get very far. My deputy's telegraphing ahead in both directions, and we'll keep a check on everyone using the road. Good, good. Talk to you later, Sheriff. Just remember, Cameron, I'm still the law. I make the arrest. So, uh, Keeler's room is next to Mr. Begley's. Mm-hmm. He's a salesman for a St. Louis dry goods company, you say? That's right. How long's he been in town? Well, he got in on the stage about a week ago. Well, that's kind of a long stay for a man in his line, isn't it? Well, he lost some samples on the road. So you'd have to stay here until they send him on some more. Mm, I see. Does uh, he and Bagley seem friendly, would you say? Oh, no, sir. Mr. Bagley's is kind of likes to keep to himself. Mr. Keeler's not his sort at all. Where was Keeler at the time of the robbery? Oh, let's see. I ran out in the street. And then I saw Mr. Keeler come running from the hotel, still pulling on his coat. So you figured he was coming from his room? That's right, Jim. Well, thank you, Tim. You've been a big help. You've been giving your a bad time asking questions? Oh, no, sir. Well, Tim, I hope you didn't tell him anything you shouldn't about me. Looks like you've covered quite a bit of territory today, Sheriff. Did you come up with anything? Nothing. You investigated every transit in the two bank employees? Of course. Well, now let's us do some telegraphing. Starting with that drummer, um... Keeler. Keeler. Would you take this, please? To the Elite Dry Goods Company, St. Louis, Missouri. Regarding your employee, Charles Keeler, please send date of employment and where previously employed. Other references, if any, facts concerning record with your company. Lucky man, Mr. Cameron. One more inch. And it would have killed me. Well, it was meant to. You know, I don't often get a doctor who is efficient and attractive. I suppose that's a nice way of saying that I'm efficient for a woman doctor. No, not at all. I believe in progress. You must have wanted to be a doctor pretty badly. I did. 
I had to make a choice between that and marriage. I chose medicine. That's why I'm here. Well, you'll find someone. As a matter of fact, you have already, haven't you? I think you're being presumptuous, Mr. Cameron. No, I just saw the way you looked at him in the bank this morning. Mr. Begley is merely my... Ah, then I was right. I was about to say that he's my patient. But not merely a patient. By the way, what's the matter with Begley, anyway? There was an accident here at the Grant Mine. He was badly injured. When he finally recovered from his injuries, he was anxious to return to his work. He was hopeless. Out here, mining engineers can't be cripples, Mr. Cameron. So he had to settle for a job in a bank. Well, that couldn't have been easy for him. No. He was very bitter for a long time. It's not easy to adjust. Most people don't understand the mental anguish. Most doctors don't. Thank you. It was fortunate that I'd learned something about how to treat cases like his. So I made Joel my guinea pig. Look at that. I found out that he was very skilled with his hands, so I put him to work. That was the result. Well, he is skilled. And if you helped him, you're a very clever doctor. <laughs> well, come back tomorrow and I'll take another look at that shoulder. If you'd like, I'll give you something for the pain. No, I'll just grit my teeth. <laughs> well, thank you, Miss Sarah. I mean, Dr. Sarah. I like the other better for my friends. Good night. Good night. You are an idiot, Keeler, using my knife to try to kill him. Don't you think at all? That's two stupid moves you've made in one day. Booze. This ain't a chess game, Begley. This is kill or get caught and hung. Sanderson showed up too soon. I had to shoot him. Same with this camera. We didn't allow for him button in. Rock's just a small town lawman, but not this one. He was onto something right off. I had to try and stop him. What if he traces that knife to me? Well, there must be a hundred knives like yours in this town. There are exactly six knives like it in this town. I had them sent all the way from Philadelphia. No, you lost your head and your nerve. You kill because you can't think of any better way. You can? You aren't fooling me, Begley. You've got some scheme cooking in that maggoty little brain of yours. Just like when you talked me into this bank job. Let's get our facts straight, Keeler. Your greed talks you into this. But you and I are still the only ones who know where the money is. And you're the only one who can get his hands on it. That's right. You never intended for me to have my share, did you? You picked the place. And I thought it was smart. But I didn't count on Cameron getting in our way. Listen to me. You sat back nice and safe while I did the dirty work. Now you're going to risk your rotten hide. You're going to get that money tonight, because I'm getting out of town some way, and I'm leaving with my share. All right. I'll see you in your room later. That's better. Gone long, Miss Begley? No, I'm just going to take a short walk, Tim. I have a bit of a headache. Sarah. 
Open up, please. Sir, I'm sorry. I know it's late. I, and I shouldn't have come here at this hour, but I've got to see you. I've got to have that knife. It isn't here. Mr. Cameron took it. Who is it? Who is it? Ward Cameron. Tell him that I've been here for half an hour. And I just left. But I can't lie to him. If you love me, you can. I'm sorry to disturb you, Dr. Sarah, but I thought perhaps Jewel Begley might be here. The uh, clerk at the hotel said he left to get some medicine. Why, yes, he was here for about a half an hour, but he just left. Was he headed back to the hotel? Why, I believe so. I'll find him then. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good evening, Cameron. Good evening, Sheriff. I got a bit of news for you. Yeah, what's that? Well, there was a bunch of miners down at the saloon giving me a bad time about the robbery. They wanted some action, so I gave them some. I arrested John Scott. Well, now all you have to do is make it stick. Help! What happened? Well, I went to Dr. Sarris to get some pills. On the way back, just now, I saw two men struggling. The other man hit Keeler on the head with something. He's dead. Go get Dr. Sarah. Why Dr. Sarah? This Dr. Porter. She could tell me what I want to know. Mr. Begley, what happened after the other man struck Keeler? Well, he must have seen me because he ran. Wait a minute. I guess we know what he was after. Part of the bank money, all right. It's got the Denver Bank stamp on the paper band. Well, looks like we've got one of them, Sheriff. Uh, Mr. Begley, can you give us a description of this man? Yes, I can. He was tall and dark and rather slender. Sounds like Scott, doesn't it? I'm afraid it was, Cameron. See, you're right about him all along, Sheriff. Well, Doctor, can you examine the wound on Keeler's head and give us the approximate time of death? It's merely routine. We just need to confirm the time of death. Well, he's not been dead long. Approximately how long? A matter of minutes, I'd say. Well, that's all we need to know. Would you walk Dr. Sarah home, please? Sure. Good night. Good night. All right, there isn't anything more you can do. Now, come on, let's go. Poor Scott. I'm sorry that I had to. I'm sure you are, Mr. Begley. Good night, now. Are you crazy? You know I've got Scott in jail. And we both know he couldn't have killed Keeler. But it was the man that got away. There was not another man. It's my guess it was only Begley. Keeler was struck with a sharp object quite a while ago. Not just minutes. Doctor knew that. She lied. Begley's cane was probably the weapon. With this $3,000, why would Begley leave it here? To plant suspicion on Keeler and Scott as accomplices, leaving himself clear. If you're so sure, why let Begley go? I'm not that sure. Not yet. But I was hired to recover the money. There's still 22000 missing. But if it's where I think it is, you'll have a clear case, Cheryl. Then you can arrest Begley. You think it was Mr. Scott who killed Keeler? I'm positive I saw him with my own eyes. Well, but you couldn't have, Mr. Begley. Not unless he got out of jail somehow. Out of jail? Yeah, the sheriff locked him up almost two hours ago. I was over at the saloon on my break. Saw Rourke put the cuffs on him.
Drop it, Captain. Drop your gun on the floor. You're altogether too good at putting two and two together, Cameron. So you deposited the money with General Grant. What a fool, Rourke. You won't get out of town, Begley. I have a way. Someone will do what I ask, without question. Not this time. You killed that man. But I can't lie about murder, John. Give me the gun. Get back, Sarah. I'll kill you, too, if I have to. I wanted to believe in you. I even wanted to believe that you loved me. You stay out of this, Sarah. Somebody had to stop him, Miss Sarah. You know that. Yes. Yes, I know it now. So it was Bagley. Yes, Sheriff. And there's your payroll money. Right under our noses. Well, that's the new. Well, did you ever hear of a robbery where the stolen money was hidden right in the bank it was taken from? He was real smart. Yes, Sheriff. He was real smart. Is my coffee good this morning? No, it's fine, Kitty. Matter of fact, it's too good for the customers here. And you're too pretty to be boring it for them. What else would I be doing? Seems to me a girl like you could do almost anything she wanted to do. If she chose the right man. The right man? Here in Grant's Pass? It's possible you haven't been looking in the right direction. I'd say that's uh, quite possible. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm Ward Cameron. I rode in rather late last night. Joe Begley's my name. Mr. Begley? Miss Kitty. Miss Kitty? My, that coffee smells good. How about some ham and eggs to go with it? Yes, sir. Well, Mr. Begley, can you tell me what time the mining company office opens? Any minute now. Oh, you excuse me, Mr. Cameron. There's my boss. I must be on my way. dangerous or deadly than the knife. It was a silent and frightening instrument. Well, hello, Dell. I'll do anything to make a point. This was the most popular cutlery of the day. It was a famous bowie knife used by Jim Bowie of Alamo fame. It was made for him by a blacksmith named James Black in Hempstead County, Arkansas in 1830. The price ranged from $5 to $50, depending on how fancy you wanted it. Yes, sir, with a sticker like this, old Jim Boy was a real cut-up. 37 times, I haven't got a chip. Another favorite of the day was 